What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. About two years ago, I released a video that somehow became one of my most popular videos of all time on my channel. And that was called five things that I wish somebody had told me before I started brewing. And today we are gonna do a part two to that video. So five more things I wish somebody had told me before I started brewing. Having at least two more years of experience under my belt now, there's a few other things that come to mind that I wish I had just known a little bit earlier in my brewing career. So number one is don't buy expensive, shiny crap. Just because something is made from stainless steel does not necessarily mean that it's a good investment. Stainless steel is the best material that you can both brew in and ferment in. Um, it is kind of the gold standard. It does not rust, it's easy to clean, and it is extremely resistant to infections because it's hard to scratch. It's hard to leave residual flavors in there and you can use harder chemicals on it to clean it, which ensure that it is indeed really clean every single time. Um, very easy to sanitize as well. You can also boil it and uh, it will kill off everything inside of it or on it. That being said, beverage grade 304 stainless steel, which is the standard, is pretty expensive. Now, what I mean by don't buy expensive shiny stuff that you don't need is not necessarily don't buy stainless steel. Uh, nothing could be further from the truth. I do encourage you to work your way towards stainless steel at some point if you are serious about this hobby. But the thing is, you have to really understand why are you getting into stainless steel? Is it because all the breweries use it and it looks cool in your garage or your basement? Or is it because you're actually going to use it for its functional purpose? So case in point, I own a Spike CF5, which is a five gallon conical fermenter that starts out at $500, but when you add all the accessories and stuff that you need to really use it to its full capacity, comes out to about $1,500. So it is not a small investment. But I also own two anvil bucket fermenters. These are also stainless steel, but they come in at $130 and they don't have any sort of bells and whistles on them. Now, I used to use my Spike CF5 all the time, and I still do use it on occasion. However, now that I live in a condo and I brew in the basement, every time I need to clean my Spike CF5, I have to haul it up two flights of stairs from the basement to the second floor in order to clean it. And this thing weighs a good 50 pounds, with all its accessories on it and with nothing in it. It's extremely frustrating to pull that thing up and down two flights of stairs to both clean and sanitize it. And this is something I never thought of prior to actually getting it. When you buy an expensive conical, it is a commitment to use it. While it has been useful, I would not recommend getting one if you have to move it around a lot. Perhaps something like the Spike Flex Plus or smaller fermenter would have been a better decision at that time, saving me future pain down the road. So I find myself using the anvil bucket fermenters a lot more. They're just so much easier to haul around and use. And I get the same performance from them because they are stainless steel. The only thing I can't do in an anvil bucket fermenter is pressure ferment. And hence, that's why I'm using Spicy F5 for some of those things. So what I'm saying is try to take a good hard look at how you brew and what you need those expensive pieces of equipment for. It's not just limited to fermenters. It's also brew systems. Um, perhaps you want an all-in-one electric brewing system for $3,000. Well, consider you can get a $500 or a $1,000 system that will do 99% of what that $3,000 system will do. So just consider the options carefully and consider what you should be spending your money on. The second thing I wish somebody had told me before I started brewing was that lagers aren't hard. It's always been kind of a homebrewing myth or a trope that lagers are really tough. Um, that especially if you're trying to do them traditionally, they can take forever. However, now that it's 2023, um, there's a lot that exists out there to really make lagers a lot quicker and easier. People used to have a difficult time working with lagers because they were choosing lager yeasts that fermented at low temperatures, like 50 degrees, and were very intolerant of hotter temperatures. And also, temperature control was a little bit tougher back in the day when these myths were established. Nowadays, it's a lot easier to get good temperature control and make a traditional lager. Even if you're using a traditional cold stored lager method to keep it and clarify it traditionally over like three or four months, it's still easy to do that when you have the right temperature control equipment like a good chest freezer. But also now it's 2023, we have a lot better understanding and a lot more availability of different kinds of yeast that can get the job done. If you wanna stick with a true lager strain, you can use Sap Lager W3470 or a Bohemian Lager strain and ferment it in the high 60s and have a clean as a whistle lager at the end of it. That's still a true lager for purists out there. But also, 
We have alternative options. Pseudo lagers are very common nowadays. Using something like Lutricovike at the appropriate mash pH can get you a very similar pseudo lager at the end of the process, but also using cleaner ale yeasts will do the job just as fine. And when it comes to the cold side of the process, lagers are famously clear. And people used to say, oh, it's so terrible making a lager because you have to cold condition it forever and ever and ever until it's finally clear. And that's not the case anymore. You can get a clear beer in a matter of days after packaging if you're using the right kind of cold side findings in combination with other types of findings. I have a pretty foolproof method to this. I'm gonna link up in the corner, so go check out that video. Uh, for some more interesting information on how to make that happen. But basically what I'm trying to say is lagers aren't really any harder to make than a regular ale is. And that's something that I did not believe for a long period of time. Number three, the third thing that I wish someone had told me was that mash pH is very important. It's pretty well accepted nowadays that water chemistry is a very important part of making great beer. Um, just as is temperature control, like I mentioned in the last edition of Five Things um, that I wish someone had told me. Now, mash pH technically falls under the umbrella of water chemistry, but I wanted to highlight it specifically because I never really cared about it until uh, about two years ago. I was making pretty good beer without caring about mash pH, but I was also kind of lucky in that the water I was using really had a good alkalinity buffer in it. So in short, nailing your mash pH not only will give you the greatest possible mash efficiency and overall brew house efficiency, but it will also give you the greatest expression of flavors for the particular style you're trying to make. If your mash pH is a little too low, it's gonna be a little too acidic when it finishes. The beer actually itself might taste tart, might taste lemony and slightly off. On the other side though, if the mash pH is too high, it will also affect the beer in terms of making it astringent or a little harsh. It might taste a little bit like a tea bag, um, which is not a great flavor. Having a high mash pH is very common when you're using uh, only Pilsner malt or only pale malt, which is why you oftentimes see an acid malt addition in something like a Pilsner, because that's intended to bring that mash pH down to the appropriate region. On the other hand though, when you're brewing a beer with lots of dark roasted grains like a porter or a stout, it's common to have that mash pH be too low, which then causes it to be tart at the end of the process. Ideally, you want your mash pH to be in the region of about 5.1 at the very lowest to 5.4 or 5.5. Um, but this also depends on when you're measuring your mash pH. Now what temperature to measure your mash pH is a debate as old as home brewing and I am not going to take a particular side on that. That one's divided about 50 50, it's a great way to start a fight in the comment section, so go at it. Generally what I do, because I'm impatient, I measure my mash pH at a hotter temperature. This is definitely bad for the probe life on your pH meter, depending on whether or not it's designed for a hot temperature. Measuring your mash pH at a higher temperature is going to actually slightly skew the reading towards the alkalinity side. So when I'm looking at mash pH at a hot temperature, I'm looking at a region of 5.2 to 5.6 in terms of being acceptable. When I'm measuring my mash pH at a lower temperature, I'm looking more like room temperature. I'm looking for a mash pH of like 5.1 to 5.4. Keep that temperature piece in mind. The right mash pH can be either one of those two things, the temperature will influence it. Regardless, what you don't want is a mash pH that is below 5.1 or above 5.6. So I measure my mash pH a few minutes into the mash. Once everything has recirculated at least once and I can kind of see where things are gonna be. Now, if I need to correct my mash pH, the best way to do that is either to add uh, lactic acid if the mash pH is too high or slaked lime, which is calcium hydroxide, if the mash pH is too low. Uh, both of these are very powerful and ensure you're getting the food grade versions of them. I'll link them in the description and that will give you the best results. You can also attempt to correct for this prior to even mashing in. Brewer's Friend has a really great pH estimator, so uh, you can actually plug in your water chemistry and your grain bill to get a good estimate of what the actual mash pH will be once you dough in. So if you wanna try and nail it before you even dough in, that's a good way to do it. You can add those aforementioned chemicals to your strike water instead of to your mash as well. 
However, there's no going back once you've added them in, so just be careful with that. The fourth thing I wish somebody had told me when I first started brewing is that hop creep is a real big problem. So hop creep, what is that? Hop creep is a really interesting thing and it's actually a relatively new uh, revelation in terms of brewing. If you've ever had a great IPA uh, and you add some dry hops to it and all of a sudden you're stuck with a diacetyl bomb, that's hop creep. Hops themselves actually have a small amount of amylase enzymes in them. When you dry hop, especially if you dry hop warmer, those enzymes become active. These enzymes then begin to slowly release sugars, which then the yeast will begin to ferment again. And if you cold condition your beer right after dry hopping warm, you will be left with an incomplete fermentation of these sugars, which actually releases diacetyl and causes a buttery, disgusting IPA. Uh, with a nice dry hop aroma. This doesn't happen all the time, but if you're carelessly dry hopping, it certainly will happen. But one of the easiest ways to avoid it is to dry hop cold. So either dry hopping in the keg or dry hopping during cold crashing will help prevent any of these amylase enzymes from releasing and uh, getting into the beer. However, be advised that if the beer ever warms up during that period, you might have hop creep. Um, this will also only show up about a couple weeks after you finished your dry hop. The other way to prevent this is to dry hop really at whatever temperature you want, but to give the beer a couple weeks at room temperature for a diacetyl rest after dry hopping. So it's for that reason that I try not to rush IPAs too much, uh, especially if I am adding a large amount of dry hops to them. Or I will dry hop directly in the keg instead to uh, get a little bit more kick without fear of any hop creep. Now, I'm certainly not an expert on the situation. Those are just the methods that I've developed that kind of help uh, keep it under control. But if you really want to learn a lot more on how to avoid hop creep in every step of the process, Craft Beer and Brewing uh, has a really, really good video series uh, with Vinny Chaluzzo of the Russian River Brewing Company who actually goes through the real deep science on how to prevent hop creep. It's a really good watch, so I do recommend it. The fifth and final thing that I wish somebody had told me when I started brewing is that dry yeast isn't inferior. This is kind of a myth that uh, has been perpetuated ever since home brewing really started taking off. Um, because there weren't really all that many good manufacturers of dry yeast out there. There wasn't all that much good process control and a lot of the strains were just kind of meh uh, relative to the liquid yeast that had a lot more specialty strains. Nowadays, once again, it's 2023, it's much easier to get a good dry yeast version of some of the best brewing strains out there that are only, or previously only were available in liquid form. I have a video that goes over many of my favorite dry yeast strains that can cover pretty much any style of beer. I'm gonna look that up in the corner, but you can check that out for some more information on just the specifics of each dry yeast strain. But the point I'm trying to make here is that dry yeast is no longer inferior to liquid yeast. You're getting a better pitch rate in most cases than liquid yeast. If you rehydrate them, you're actually getting vitalized and ready to go yeast. And also these manufacturers have really cleaned up their game and there's also some specialty strains that are only available in dry form. The dry yeast isn't gonna suffer from shipping issues with heat uh, during the summer. And it also stays good for a lot longer than liquid yeast does. So there's a number of things about dry yeast that do in a way make it better than liquid yeast. Um, so it's certainly not inferior and many many of my brews of late have been done with dry yeast. As of late I've been doing a ton of brewing with the Lalamand Laubaru Premium series of yeasts uh, which has some really really great options. So like the Verdant strain is there, uh, the Philly Sour is there. These are strains that you can only find in dry format. <laughs> Um, and one of my favorite Belgian strains of all time just happens to now be the Lalamand Abbey Ale strain, um, which made an absolutely incredible triple and a really good Potter's beer. There's plenty of reasons to still use liquid yeast. All I'm trying to say is that the, the old adage that dry yeast sucks is just plain wrong. So I hope you guys enjoyed that video and you learned something. If you don't mind, please go ahead, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, comment down below as well. If you wanna support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one um, or other type of merchandise from my merch store that's linked in the description box. You can also find a bunch of other things on that. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon supporters are super freaking helpful in helping this channel get to where it is now. 
big thank you to you guys for helping out. But also I have channel memberships. There's the super thanks button as well if you feel inclined to hit that. And um, I also have an Amazon store where you can pick up a bunch of the uh, brewing equipment that I recommend. You can also check out the camera equipment that I've been using if you like the way that this video looks. If you want to follow me on more than just YouTube, I'm also active on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check that out for some more frequent content than just YouTube. And if you're still here, thank you very much for being here all the way to the end of the video. I appreciate your time, and thank you for watching. This one goes out to you guys. And until the next one, cheers.